Towards sunset, we entered a beautiful green valley, dotted with chalets. A cosy little domain hidden away from the busy world, in a cloistered nook among giant precipices. Topped with snowy peaks that seemed to float like islands above the curling surf of the sea of vapor that severed them from the lower world. Down from these vague and vaporous heights, little ruffled zigzag milky currents came crawling and found their way to the verge of one of those tremendous overhanging walls from whence they plunged. A shaft of silver shivered to atoms in mid-descent and turned to an air puff of luminous dust. Here and there, in grooved depressions amongst the snowy desolations of the upper altitudes, one glimpsed the extremity of a glacier with its sea-green and honeycomb battlements of ice. We struck out and followed a roaring torrent of ice water to its far source. Here the rushing brook goes booming and thundering down to Candlestick, lashing and thrashing its way over monster boulders and hurling chance roots and logs about like straws. We could see the streams which fed the torrent we had followed issuing from under the greenish ramparts of glaciers. I had never been in such intimate relations with the high altitudes before. The snow peaks had always been remote and unapproachable grandeur hitherto. But now we were hobnob, if one may use such a seemingly irreverent expression about creations so august as these. I needed exercise, so I employed my agent in setting stranded logs and dead trees adrift. And I sat on a boulder and watched them go whirling and leaping, head over heels down the boiling torrent. When I had had enough exercise, I made the agent take some by running a race with one of those logs. I made a trifle by betting on the log. The spirit of the place was a sense of deep, pervading peace. One might dream his life tranquilly away there, and not miss it, or mind it when it was gone. From here forward, we move through a storm-swept and smileless desolation. All about us rose gigantic masses, crags, and ramparts of bare and dreary rock. With not a vestige or semblance of plant or tree or flower anywhere, the frost and tempests of unnumbered ages had battered and hacked these cliffs with a deathless energy, destroying them piecemeal. But every now and then, through the stern gateways around us, we caught a view of some neighboring majestic dome, sheathed with glittering ice and displaying its white purity at an elevation compared to which ours was groveling and plebeian. And this spectacle always chained one's interest and admiration at once and made him forget there was anything ugly in the world. I was also walking into a new world. I saw with new eyes. I had been looking aloft at the giant show peaks only as things to be worshipped for their grandeur and magnitude and their unspeakable grace of form. I looked up at them now as also things to be conquered and climbed. 
My sense of their grandeur and their noble beauty was neither lost nor impaired. I had gained a new interest in the mountains without losing the old ones. I followed the steep lines up, inch by inch, with my eye, and noted the possibility of following them with my feet. When I saw a shining helmet of ice projecting above the clouds, I tried to imagine I saw files of black specks toiling up it roped together with a gossamer thread. We were approaching Zermatt. Consequently, we were approaching the renowned Matterhorn. A month before, this mountain had only been a name to us, but latterly we had been moving through a steadily thickening double row of pictures of it, done in oil, water, chromo, wood, steel, copper, crayon and photography. And so it had at length become a shape to us, and a very distinct, decided and familiar one too. We were expecting to recognize that mountain whenever or wherever we should run across it. We were not deceived. The monarch was far away when we first saw him, and there was no such thing as mistaking him. He has the rare peculiarity of standing by himself. He is peculiarly steep too, and is also most oddly shaped. He towers into the sky like a colossal wedge, with the upper third of its blade bent a little to the left. The broad base of this monster wedge is planted upon a grand glacier-paved alpine platform whose elevation is 10,000 feet above sea level. As the wedge itself is some 5,000 feet high, it follows that its apex is about 15,000 feet above sea level. So the whole bulk of this stately piece of rock, this sky-cleaving monolith, is above the line of eternal snow. Yet while all its giant neighbors have the look of being built of solid snow from their waist up, the Matterhorn stands black and naked and forbidding. Its strange form, its august isolation and its majestic unkinship with its own kind make it, so to speak, the Napoleon of the mountain world. Grand, gloomy, and peculiar. Think of a monument a mile high, standing on a monument two miles high. This is what the Matterhorn is, a monument. Its office, henceforth, for all time, will be to keep watch over the young Lord Douglas, who, in 1865, was swept from the summit over a precipice 4,000 feet high and never seen again. No man ever had such a monument as this before. The most imposing of the world's other monuments are but atoms compared to it, and they will perish and their places will pass from memory, but this will remain. <laughs>